If you want to understand more about what leadership looks like in the present-day church, there may be no greater illuminating story than Caldi and the Dancing Goats. A popular legend traces the origin of coffee to around 750 AD when an Ethiopian goat herd named Caldi observed his goats dancing and frolicking around. Caldi had always found his goats to be well behaved, so he knew that something strange was going on. Upon further investigation, Caldi saw that the goats were happily eating the red berries and shiny green leaves of an unfamiliar tree. He decided to try some, and when he did, he joined the goats in their dance, becoming, quote, the happiest herder in happy Arabia. A passing monk observed Caldi and the goats and wondered what was going on. When Caldi told him about the berries, the monk thought they might be the answer to his prayers, literally. It seems that the monk was always falling asleep in the middle of prayers. When he ate the berries, he stayed awake. The unnamed monk came up with the idea of roasting, grinding, and dissolving them in water to yield a hot beverage. His fellow monks loved the new drink because it encouraged them to pray. And it tasted good, too. And so, coffee was born. From these humble beginnings, the world would grow to love coffee. It began small and sustainable. When you wanted a cup of coffee, you roasted a small batch right then and there. Cups were passed around and shared in homes, monastery kitchens, and any place where conversations passed late into the night. In time, beans were exported to the West, and coffee seedlings were given as gifts to dignitaries and royalty. Now that it was being distributed around the world, coffee shops began to spring up all over Europe. Like anything else that is good, in time, coffee became a commodity. Methods and techniques were refined and production was scaled. Roasters perfected their processes so that the coffee tasted the same from batch to batch and grew to become giant mechanized factories. To meet this new demand, individual trees gave way to small plots of land that eventually became large farms and then giant plantations. The mindset became, get all we can and can all we get. At the time, the industrialization of coffee was a good thing. It allowed uniformity of experience and gave people a certain comfort. It was the best part of their morning. They needed what they were getting and they could trust it and it was appropriate for that time. And isn't the story of the church similar to the legend of Kaldi and the dancing goats? It started small and conversational, in homes, synagogues, and in the marketplace. Early followers of Jesus were transforming and creating neighborhood groups, guilds, and associations. The message of the gospel spread to Asia and Europe, and eventually to the Americas, through small batch seedling communities. But the church wanted to move toward more efficient methods of distribution to effectively evangelize. In an expanding world, the systems and sacraments of the church became efficiently packaged for mass consumption and expansion. This mechanized model continued to serve the church well into the 20th century. But the world changed. People used to want sameness and comfort and no surprises. Now people strive for authenticity. There is a mistrust of institutions and a palpable longing for localism, for contextualization, for slowness and rootedness. We prefer to linger over a slow pour coffee decanted from a Chemex instead of hurriedly scooping flavor crystals into an electric gadget. We long to be surprised by a new small batch single origin roast to reclaim our humanness. The world has changed and how we view church leadership needs to change with it. The small batch coffee, bourbon, beer, and bakery movements are good examples of how innovators are connecting to their peers. Scale is no longer the quintessential goal of business. 
More and more people are baking, distilling, and creating businesses in their homes and selling to their friends. What is coming into view is a society that is restructuring itself organically. This is our mission field. We live in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. The ministry of a VUCA adaptive church requires adaptive visionary leaders ready to go out and gain clarity and understanding by doing the work of the mission. God's work in the VUCA world needs a church that is missional, that is courageous, flexible, diverse, and creative to its core. It's a church defined not by buildings and those inside them, but by relationships and engagement with those not yet in the embrace of Jesus and his body. The maker movement is extending to the church. The future church will be distributed leadership. How can you identify and encourage a new crop of small batch leaders in your current context? Thank you.